getting back to somebody is a lot different to getting back at them. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to my show. I feel a bit like Tim the Tool Man, you know. Ah, yay. All right. So today we're getting serious about our topic, right? Reassembly required. So I thought, first of all, I'll start off with the assembly part. Now, as you know, most things in life require some assembly. And the good thing is most things come with a list of instructions. So today's project is very complex, a bit like building the earth, you know. It's actually a, a, a laundry trolley. All right, here, and I'll show you one I prepared earlier. <laughs> now, the good thing about instructions is they come with everything you need to know. It's right there. And I was talking to the hairdresser yesterday, <laughs> and uh, we are talking about what I'm going to speak at in church. I need a haircut, you know, I'm going to look good at the church. Well, anyway, we moved on from that. And um, she got to talking about, thank you, I'll pay you later. And she got to talking about her relationship. I said, how long have you been with your partner? And she said, actually, we've never been married, you know. It's like 23 years. We kind of got kids and we got the house and got everything else in the way <laughs> first. We never got to the instruction. So I mentioned to her that I can, having done lots of weddings, over the years, I can often pick the couples that are not going to last the distance. I'm not infallible, but there's just some obvious things sometimes. And the ones that don't do so well, the ones that didn't read the instructions first, that's how I approach projects. Men, do you ever do that and say, I'll get back to that if I need it? <laughs> so we start off and, uh, okay. So here's our little project, ladies and gentlemen. It's a, a good old laundry trolley. As I say, I prepared this one earlier. Uh, I've read a review on this one. This is the actual review from a customer. Has the most stupid wheel assembly ever. Had to use a tool supplied and a hammer not supplied to put an end on the axles and broke one of them trying to do it. So then I had to use my old wheels and axle from the old trolley to fix it. And uh, I recommend that you buy one that's already pre-assembled. <laughs> So it says, get your, your hammer out. So I got my biggest hammer I got. <laughs> Nothing was really happening there, so forget that one. How about this hammer? This is a real hammer. Okay, bang, bang, bang. I got the wheel on and then realised I didn't put the spacer on yet. It's in the instructions, but I forgot to do that bit. So I had to pull that off, but it doesn't say how to pull that off. So you get this one, and then you realise, hang on, I think I need another one. How about this one? Whoop, there it goes. And so then you start whacking at this one until that one pops off without trying to break anything. Have you ever done this, guys? I don't know. The women would have read the instructions, but <laughs> we guys, we get into it that way. And then if that doesn't work, well, there's always this one. <laughs> okay. You know where I'm going with that. Now, we got it assembled. That was pretty good. First day Dot used it, she took the basket off and this went, this went like that. <laughs> so then I had to be creative. Some of them come with a nice clip, by the way. You can get these from all the, you know, the big hardware store, that other one, or <laughs> the other retailers. So I could, this is what you get when you get your computer stuff. And you take that and you just sort of wind it around here. This is my creation. So it won't fall off. Are you having fun yet? Okay. <laughs> then you just twist that around. It doesn't matter how many times you do it, it'll come off anyway. <laughs> and then you can head, hang your pegs up here. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the laundry trolley. <laughs> my... Um, Thankful to my minions, I'll take this away for me. Thank you very much. I'll I'll take that part. I'll keep that. Thank you. Wow, are we having fun? All right. What? How not to do things? That's it. What was the instructions on moving that? Okay. All right, it can go down there. 
That can come up here. We might need some of these later. Wow. Are you exhausted yet? <laughs> what I dropped this time? <laughs> I got you my best view. That's right. <laughs> Ladies and jelly beans. It's about assembly and reassembly required. Sometimes in life, um, we've been hearing this in the song we just sang, and I'm kind of excited by that song we sang just now. You know, we can get in the habit of becoming a people of God that forget that miracles are involved. We think we can just read the instructions and everything's going to be sweet. But we need God to step in, in the middle of reading between the lines and actually do things that we can't do. Do you agree with that? Well, the good thing about um, most instructions is they come with another page. It looks like this. If I can pull it up there. It says, Troubleshooting Guide. Okay, well, mine is like, this is the good luck. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what comes with this one. If you can't figure it out, too bad. Life's a bit like that. So we are here today to present to you the infallible method. It's called the um, C4 approach. So in the C4 approach, as we were introduced last week, thank you, Pastor Kim, we start to enjoy some of the wisdom, you know, how we can fix relationships. There is convince, convict, coerce, and control. Now, some of you have used these methods and you understand that C4 is a description of explosive. <laughs> it's a bit dynamite, really. So it's like this. You've got convince. You've got convict. <laughs> then you've got coerce. And finally, if that doesn't work, <laughs> you've got control. You know, some of these relationship tools, you'll love to have them all of your life. They'll help you. You'll say, thank you, Pastor Lynn. You've been so, so helpful. Well, we found out that these C4 things don't work. Have you found that? I mean, they kind of work and we go to them straight away as our fallback position. We think, if I can just get this one right, the convincing, you know, it's like this, if you just listen to me for a moment, I'll tell you all the facts you need to know. And then you'll say, oh, Len, of course, I'm so sorry. You were right all along. Is that right, Dot? <laughs> <laughs> Convince. Mm -hmm. What about convict? Well, convict is that old uh, chestnut, you know. After all that I've done for you, the things I've done to help you, can't you at least see it my way? <laughs> well, that's the way it shouldn't go. Convince and convict, as you know, are words that come from the courtroom. Has you ever watched a parliament on, or listened to it on radio? Isn't that exciting stuff? <laughs> Talk about convince and, and convict, yeah. Well, we know that these courtroom terms are not really relationship terms. They're all about up here terms, what's going on in my mind, what I want to happen. Now, some of you come from a, a blended family. Mine was more like a food processor. <laughs> there were just bits and pieces everywhere, really. And so you think when you're growing up, that's what life's going to be like. You know, there's no other alternative. And my hairdresser kindly said, you must have been married for a little while. And I said, yeah, 45 years. I said, don't believe that I'm an expert. <laughs> I've just learned all the ways not to do things. <laughs> and she's telling me about her relationship. I almost gave her my card and said, give me a call, I'll do the wedding. But you know what I'm saying is we don't really have the tools just in ourselves, just reading the instructions even, to really pull this thing off. Coerce and control, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, we think, if I can just get you in the right position, I'll make things happen the right way, and our relationship's just going to shine, baby. It's going to be good. Well, it doesn't happen all that. The problem is these four Cs, the C4 approach, they have something in common. It's what the person or people on the other side are feeling. What do they feel when you start to convince and convict and coerce and control? They feel rejection. Rejection is that sense that 
you're not listening to me, you're not hearing me, you're not feeling anything that I'm feeling, at least you're not showing me that you are, and so they feel rejection. And rejection is like kryptonite to a relationship. It's the very thing that makes you go all wobbly. You know, I can't do this anymore. Some people have got that point. We have friends and friends of friends and family of friends and family who have all reached that point in recent days where they said, we can't do it anymore. And they split, you know, and the kids are involved and it's just messy and it feels horrible. If only we could just pray a prayer and it would all be okay. You know, I believe firmly in miracles from God. I believe that God wants to do a miracle today. But we cannot just fix things by a simple prayer. God says, I want to shape you in this relationship. I want to make a difference. Rejection closes hearts. It limits the access. It undermines our influence. And do you know what everything, everybody wants in a relationship is to be agenda free. Isn't that what you want? Wouldn't it be great just to be a couple and not have an agenda on each side of that couple? Just to be? And if stuff comes up, which it will, (laughs) it has to because you're human beings and you're different. (laughs) When that comes up, your agenda is different than I want the best for me only. It's about what I want for us, what we need. You know, we need to be in that position where I just want you to want me for me. Just, just be happy with that, you know, who I am. Is that enough for you? Even if I'm a messy, what, me, what, a, what if I'm like that? Let's do that. So it doesn't seem like it should be that hard to have a good relationship, but it is. Why? Because we're crazy. We think the C4 approach is going to work. Just give me another hammer. (laughs) Just give me the next size up. I'll I'll sort this one out. Don't you worry. But reassembling, this is the point, reassembling a broken relationship is a learned experience. It's a skill that we don't come with. Even if we've been brought up with this beautiful book, we still haven't been trained naturally for what it takes. So we come into the world unlearned, unskilled. And some of us have never seen it modelled for us either. have never been taught what a good relationship is. Like I said, you, your family tree might be a bit of a mixed up grafting here and chopped off there. and You're not sure. The C4 approach is like dynamite to relationships. It's explosive and it's reactive. So today we come to part two of the real series. <laughs> the real series is called Reassembly Required, A Beginner's Guide to Repairing Broken Relationships. This is where we get started afresh, something new. The miracles can happen. Most of us want to be reconciled, don't we? Most of us want to be connected again. And yet we can come to that point where we think that'll never happen. It couldn't possibly happen. And God's got his way of doing things. Sometimes it takes a long time. But we want relationships to be fixed or reassembled with friends and family. We don't like the tension. Not many of us do. Some of us strive on it. But (laughs) most of us don't like the tension of a broken relationship. We don't like living with guilt or pretending, you know, putting on that mask that everything's okay when it's not. Besides, we're only as happy as the core relationships we have are healthy. Well, (laughs) you know what? Imagine this. This is, sir, your problems stem from your healthy relationships with your parents and siblings, (laughs) said no counsellor ever. (laughs) You know, we don't have that luxury often. We are only as content as our core relationships are mutually satisfying. What do I mean? As long as we actually are satisfying ourselves and the other person, then that relationship's going to be a tension point. Broken relationships take a toll on our mental, emotional, spiritual and physical health. 
we do a course at the church called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. And we say you can't really be spiritually mature until you're emotionally mature. And we don't like that sort of language. <laughs> can't I just do it anyway? <laughs> and just get there in the end. And the last time Pastor Kev set out our ex expectations and clarified the win situation that relates to reassembling adult relationships. And Pastor Kev reminded us that the goal is not reconciliation. You may say that sounds weird and counterintuitive, but the goal is not reconciliation, the goal is no regrets. We want to be in a situation where we could say, I've opened my arms, I've put my drawbridge down, I've done everything I can to reassure that person that I care about them, I love them, and now it's really open for them. If they wish to enter in, if they would enter in, they can do so. And that's more of our goal than to say, we've ended up reconciled. We may or may not, in the end, be reconciled to that person. There's a reality. It's a bit like God and us, God and people. The many of the people we know and love may never be reconciled to God. Is that because God didn't do all that he could for them? No. He said, I've put the drawbridge down. I've opened my arms. And now I want you to come. And that's what we need to, to think about as we're looking at relationships today. The four C's always make things worse. The temptation is to say that I'm not going to do the four C's. But that's a decision not to do something. You see the difference is we need a decision to do and be something different for the relationship to work. So a decision not to do something is not enough to get something done. Reassembling a relationship requires four proactive decisions, and we're going to start with one of them today. And they're decisions that pave the way, they don't guarantee reconciliation, but they pave the way towards getting back with somebody. And I'll give you the first one today, if you've got your note taking ready, you can put away the other notes you've made and start now. If you're not a follower of Jesus, as Pastor Kev said, you can take what you like out of this. There's some helpful bits but if you are a follower of Jesus, there's no option. This is where it gets serious. You as a follower of Christ need to be like Christ. And we'll look at that. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Philippians 2.5. He said, in your relationships, all of them, everywhere, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. That means the same perspective, the same attitudes, the same go-to position. And if you, I'll be honest, I don't go to Christ's mindset naturally. I need his help all the time. I need to be exhausted of my efforts sometimes before I'll come back to say, oh, there it was all the time. Look what Christ would do. And I do that. This is where we're tempted to tap the brakes a little bit and say, well, don't forget Jesus was uh, the offended party. Don't forget that Jesus was the offended one. He was the one that was put to death. He was the one that had every right to say, that's enough, I've had enough with creation. <laughs> I did my best and they're not even returning to me. I'm just going to give up. Imagine if he didn't rise from the dead. Imagine if he stayed in that burial tomb because everything was too hard. Relationships can be like that. We feel that we've been crucified, we're put in the tomb, but we're not ready for the resurrection yet. We're not ready to be brought alive again in God. God has so committed, been so committed to reconciling and reconnecting us to himself that he made the first move by sending his son to redeem us. And he says, have that mindset when it comes to relationships. Have that same attitude that... God has towards you, towards the other person. Adopting the same mindset as Christ Jesus requires us to accept the next part. The reassembling begins with us, regardless of who initiated the fuss. Reassembly begins with us, regardless of who started it. You started it, 
No, you started it. <laughs> you remember what you said back at Auntie Jean's? <laughs> yeah, that was 15 years ago. We forget sometimes what the fuss was and why it started. And we say, well, I'm okay. I knew I was right all along, <laughs> you know. But it requires us to do a, a turnaround. Even if, it's one, even if it is 100% your fault or their f- fault, sorry, that's, that's the hard thing. That's when we tell our sad story and you tell your devastating story and Jesus says, well, I'll tell you my story. <laughs> Jesus says, you guys didn't really deserve to come to be with my Father in heaven. But I loved you anyway. And I did everything necessary for you. Well, we might want to ask permission just to wait now. We've done our little bit, you know, made reconciliation possible. And we just want to sit back and wait like this. See what happens. But God doesn't want us to wait. Reassembly begins with us regardless of who initiated the fuss. And that brings us to the first of the four decisions that pave the way to reconciliation. Reassembly is required. And the first one we want to talk about is a decision to get back to, not get back at. Small difference in words, but it means a lot. Getting back to somebody is a lot different to getting back at them. This is what it looks like to be your father in heaven. You know, he can take that attitude. And people think this is what God's like. It's horrible. They think God is just there waiting to get back at me. But it's the opposite is true. God has done everything possible to get back to you and for you to get back to him. Here the Apostle Paul takes his letter um, to the Christians of Nero's Rome. And he has never met these people in Rome. Yeah, he's writing to them and giving them relationship advice. Imagine how that would go. Well, he's going to tell them what they need. And he answers the question of what does it look like to embrace the mindset of Christ? Well, he says it's like this. It's not what you expect. First of all, in verse uh, chapter 12, verse 9, he says... Love must be sincere. Love can't be faked. It can't be just a pretend. You know, love for another person. I love kids. You know when you work with kids? They look at you and they say, you smell. (laughs) Hey, hang on a minute. What are you talking about? They're so honest, you know. And kids don't muck around. And people in relationships, they're like that too. They don't muck around. They know they might put on a face, but they know you smell. <laughs> you know, sometimes you go to the bathroom. I'll be delicate here. You go to the bathroom, do your wash up. Yeah, yeah. And then somebody rings the phone and you pick up the phone and you smell your fingers. Oh, man, I thought I'd cleaned up. <laughs> <laughs> See, Pastor Kev couldn't, couldn't get away with that one. But you know what I'm saying is we sometimes are the last one to know. Some people look at me and say, I don't know the name, but the the smell is familiar. You know, (laughs) the breath is familiar. You know what I'm saying is we are often the ones who think we're offended when the whole time we're oblivious to how we are in this relationship making things happen. So love must be sincere. We must have done all that we can knowledgeably do to address who we are so we love that person. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. So we might be back on verse 9 still. We'll go back one, that's good. Love must be sincere. Is there another part to that? Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. So in other words... Hating someone without hating a person is impossible. You know, we don't hate. No way. (laughs) Well, we may just strongly dislike some people. But you know what I'm saying? We do actually hate. We have that propensity in the human being to be a hater of others. And there's songs written about that. But we need to be the one that says, I've addressed my hate issue. I don't hate you. I just don't like what you're doing. And that's different. You can despise what someone's saying and doing, but not hate that person. 
How do I know that? Well, God did that for me. <laughs> what if we decide to hate a what and not a who? And then you'll find it easier to cling to what is good in them. I've often heard it said, you can't hate somebody you're praying for. Think about that. If you keep lifting them up and saying, God, bless them. God, you see them in a way that I don't. And then it's hard to keep hating them. You despise what they're doing. You hate what they're saying. But you hate the what, not the who. And then he goes on to verse 10 and he says, Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Man, what does the honour others above myself mean? It means to defer them and say, yes, dear, you're right. How can I help? <laughs> you know, that doesn't happen very often, does it? <laughs> We're being honest here. I've got my, my coach and judge over there. But what I'm saying is we need to come to a place where we realise what we're doing. We think in our minds we're doing it one way when in fact, oh, okay, I stink. <laughs> you know, I know it's a gross analogy, but I need you to take it seriously because there's so much of my life that's just like that in the eyes of God. <laughs> God was able to say to Israel, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. <laughs> In my son, don't bring your offering to me. Don't you dare bring to me your so-called devotion until you address the way you deal with yourself. That's serious stuff, isn't it? Are you cringing yet? Wait, hang on, I'm getting that. <laughs> right. That's a hammer that we don't want, you know. God has his way with us. He goes on in verse 14 to say this. Don't just stop at not hating them. Bless those who persecute you. Don't you love that? <laughs> bless those who persecute you. Well, what does it mean to bless them? It means to honour them and lift them up and hope the very best happens for them. Bless and do not curse. But what if I enjoy seeing them fail? <laughs> Hang on a minute. Let's get real. What if they're... Unsuccess is what brings me a bit of happiness. <laughs> yeah, I told you that would happen. You know, go off that bloke and look what happened. You know, go off that woman. Yeah. We feel that. We're honest human beings. We don't rejoice in their success, especially if they've hurt you or someone you love and someone you're close to. How can I bless them? <laughs> Jesus says, well, that's what I do to you. I bless you. I lift you up. I want the very best for you. It's not a modern term at all. <laughs> we tend to want to skim over it. Not many of us would say we're, we're being persecuted, but, uh, you know, if you're a teenager, maybe, yeah. <laughs> say about mum and dad, they're persecuting me. <laughs> but adults, adults, we don't do it. We're not really persecuted like the Romans were, but even to them he said... You know, they were really persecuted for their faith. He said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. But I feel like you're putting the responsibility on me. Well, I'm not. Paul is, <laughs> officially. But we've got to grow up a bit sometimes. <laughs> you, you do, not me. But that's right. We need to come to a place where we actually get adult about our faith. Uh, there, I said it. Grow up. And I'm looking in the mirror, looking at the man in the mirror. You know, this is what we have to deal with honestly. And so we get to another place where Paul says, once you get past that, then you can rejoice with those who, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. You can actually start to enter into what they're going through and feel it their way. What if they're sad, this makes me happy? Well, turn it around. You've got work to do, says Paul. It's time for you to rejoice when they're happy. Find a, a new way forward. And then he goes on and makes it even more difficult. He says in verse 16, live in harmony with one another. <laughs> Isn't it enough just that I feel happy that they're happy? 
No, live in harmony. As much as it depends on you, right, this is the point, as much as you have control over it, this is the one place where control and coerce works, it's in you, <laughs> as much as you're responsible, then be happy, be at one, don't be proud. Pride excites the four C's. It sets us off on that control and convince and convict. But really, you know, it's not a matter of I'm right and you're wrong. That's what pride says. Here's the payoff in Paul's version of our first decision that we have to do is get back to and not get back at. He says in verse 17, don't repay anyone evil for evil. Don't get back at them. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Hey, have some faith in that. If it's really God's place to do the judging, get off that anvil and that that place of judge and start to work at getting back to. So intuitively we want to pay them back. Anyone who hears your story would agree. (laughs) You know, you feel justified, your anger, your opposition. But the Holy Spirit and Jesus and you are trying to tap that down. It's natural for us to want to get back at, but the Holy Spirit and the will of God says, let's get back to that person. I hope this is being helpful to you. Not the four C's part, throw that away. But this part, this first of four decisions we get to make. Because it's what the Heavenly Father did for you. So decision number one, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to get back to, not get back at. There's some reassembly required. This decision, if you make it, ensures that you don't go halfway. What do I mean? You you know, um, you've crossed your arms now. You said, I forgave them. Let's see what they do with it. That's a halfway getting back to. But instead, you lower your drawbridge, you put out your arms and say, I'm still here, I'm still loving you, I'm still, I don't like what you're doing, but I still want us to be together. And that's hard, isn't it? But look at what Jesus did. In John 3.16, you could all quote it back to me, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's who we are and that's where we need to be with him. And then he went on to say, that wasn't enough. He said in verse 17, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It wasn't enough for him to die for us. He said, now I want you back. Your sins are forgiven, but I want you back. Your sins are forgiven. I want you back. Reassembly is required. I will get back to, not get back at. If someone has come to your mind as we've been talking, that's where the Holy Spirit is saying you've got work to do. It's time for you to say right now today, God, I'm going to listen to you and I want you to help me get back to that person. And I'm going to suggest a little prayer for us as we come to a close. And this is the prayer if you would do it. And insert the name of that person or people that have come to mind. And you say this prayer, Heavenly Father, help me to see their name the way that you do. Help me to feel towards them what you feel. Yeah, this is good stuff, isn't it? We could just go away and forget what we've talked about, but let's go this week and make it our project to find it whoever it is that God lays on our heart to say, God, Father, help me to see that person, that relationship, the way you do. Sin breaks God's heart because sin breaks people and relationships. So I want to be more broken-hearted that the relationship is broken than I am angry at them. I want to be more broken-hearted that my relationship is not working than I am at that person for what they've done. So I pray, Lord, help me to see them the way you see them. 
We're going to sing a song in worship, and it's not just a worship song, it's got some great words. And the words are like this, before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. It, I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. You give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up. There's no mountain you wouldn't climb up. You're coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. No lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. Make that a model, that prayer, that song of the way God wants you to live out this week and the rest of your life. What will it take? What shadows to light up? What mountains to climb up? Coming after that relationship. God bless you.